So the other trick I play on myself, you call it a trick, every time I look at my portfolio value, I would always imagine that it's down 50%. Oh. Always let the market serve you. So take advantage of this idiot called Mr. Market. How do you make sure that the businesses that you select yeah. are really high quality business that mm. can last with time? To me, the most important criteria is the... Meet Adam Koo, a self-made millionaire with a near $18 million portfolio. He's also a successful entrepreneur who co-founded a leading education empire in Asia. A best-selling author of 14 books, Adam shares his wealth creation and personal development strategies with his nearly 1 million YouTube followers. He's a leading figure in the financial space, inspiring many to achieve success. What's your advice to people who keep on thinking, oh my god, you know the market is crashing and all this. How do you make them more stable? It's what Buffett said that 70% of investing success is psychology. No one can make you feel sad except yourself. No one can make you feel angry except yourself because you create your own emotions, right? If you create your emotions, what does it mean? It means you are in control. You have the power to change it like that. Hi everyone, welcome back to Aligato Investor. And today I have this amazing, amazing investor on my channel. I just feel so honored when he said yes to my interview. And this person is none other than someone that you're very familiar with. You have been watching his content all the time. And he is Adam Koo. Ooh. Adam, thanks so much for being here today with us. Pleasure. And thank you so much, JJ, for also having this wonderful setup so that we have this ability to meet Adam in person. No, no, I'll kudos to you for taking a lot of people have already been following your work for so many years. You are a great investor. You are also a great entrepreneur. So today we'll be diving into different aspects of your life so that we can add more twists to this interview. Is that okay? Great. Yep. Oh, thank you. Now, my first question to you is, um, I know you are a long-term fan of Warren Buffett's work, right? You also do a lot of Buffett way of investing. Yeah. And I see there's a lot of similarity between how you invest and in fact, how you lead your life as well. How you do business. Buffett started his entrepreneurship at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. And you also started that since a very young age. Can you share with us a little bit more about like what inspired you to have this entrepreneurial spirit since young? I, I guess it's always a combination of maybe your personality and also a bit of your background. So in terms of personality, I don't know, since I was young, I was always uh, thinking of how to make money. And I was always the kind of person that, you know, I can't have a boss. I can never listen to someone because, I don't know, I must always do my own thing. It's always been my personality since I was young. And so people think I was weird, like he's antisocial and that. So I was always a bit like an odd person out. So personality-wise, maybe. Background-wise, um, so I come from a family where my dad and my uncles, they are all very, very successful. And they're all like self-made. So like my, my dad did really well for himself. So I grew up in quite a well-to-do environment. I grew up in like a bungalow with a swimming pool. Uh, my uncles are all multi-multi-millionaires. They all live in mansions. So in a way, I grew up in a family where it's normal to live in a bungalow with a swimming pool. It's like a normal thing, right? And it's normal to make a few million a year. So when you grow up in the environment, it's like you're expected to do that yourself. Uh, but at the same time, and I shared this a lot in my books and previous interviews, that my dad was someone who, our uh, only son, but he told me at a very young age uh, that uh, food and education, I'll give you, right? But not overseas education. You study in Singapore, you can't make it to Singapore, you too bad. You find a way to pay for overseas if you can do it for yourself. Uh, but other than that, he would not give me more. So for example, like in school, I didn't get more money than my friends. In fact, I got less money than my friends. I still remember I was very uh, unhappy in a way. Like for example, was, you know, like primary school in those days, my friends would get, I think, you know, $2, was it $3 back in the 80s, right? And they could buy what they want. But my dad would arrange with the B Thai Buck seller, the B Thai Buck, the noodle seller to you know, prepare that thing for me. And he wouldn't give me extra money, all right? Drinks all, all prepared. And it's like, if I, I wanted toys, I wanted to play games last time, like kids, and he always said that, you want, you go and buy yourself, right? So in a way, I grew in a family where I saw, okay, my uncles, they have so much money, but I don't have. 
So that kind of like drove me like, okay, fine, you don't want to give me, I, I make my own money. So that's why um, at 15, I actually started my first business, which was a mobile disco business. I've talked a lot about that before. Yeah. And I did a lot of part-time jobs as well. I was, I was doing door-to-door -door sales, sales, selling stationery and things like that. I mean, my father, so initially I didn't like my father, la, you know, I was like, why is he so stingy? He doesn't like me, he doesn't love me, you know, you know when you're young, right? Very straight. But as you grow older, you, you appreciate, you know, and then you, you start to understand. Uh, and what he told me years ago was that, you know, son, it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I wanted to torture you. But I said, I knew that the way to kill a person's motivation is to give them what they want, all right? And he shared a story of, I, I wouldn't mention, like one of our other family members where the parents gave the kids everything. and gave them credit cards, unlimited spending, and all turned out to be bums. Mm. You know, all turned out to be useless people. And he said, Adam, the reason why you are successful is because I gave you nothing. Okay. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I can't argue with that. Yeah. So, like, uh, with that, right, I think your dad has really created a huge impact. To, to you ever since young. And I know, I remember there was another podcast interview that sometimes because you are quite naughty in your own way that when they ask you to do this thing, then you purposely do the other yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. That's my personality, yeah. right? Yeah. So like, I, I remember you say that there was one time that actually your dad actually said that you're stupid. And you, in fact, instead of being affected by that, you took it as a motivation to really work very hard in your own way. Yeah. How can you be so positive all the time? Okay, so first understand that, you know, I must forgive my father, right? Because he, he comes from the old generation where you never praise your kids, the older generation. You never say, good job, never. You always say, you know, so it's I, you know, stupid boy. You know, that, that's the generation, right? So it was very common when I was young, my father coming, hey, you idiot, no? You're a bloody idiot, no? Right? It, it's very common in those days, right? So in a way, it's my personality, I've learned a lot of psychology in NLP. So I learned that I'm what we call a polarity responder. A polarity responder is someone where the more you say, don't do it, don't touch, they will touch. It's just their personality, okay? And in NLP, I also learned that some people are motivated towards things. Some people are motivated away from things. And my personality, I'm an away from person. So for example, if someone's a towards person, you tell them, hey, you know, you can do it, you can set your goals, you can achieve it, you go, yes, right? But I'm not like that. So mm. I'm the kind of person, if you were to tell me you can do it, it's like, mm, okay. Uh. <laughs> but if you tell me, Adam, you cannot do it, you're a loser, you never succeed, the, I get more motivated to do it. So wow. it's just my personality. I'm just like that, right? Okay. And my elder daughter is also like that. Okay. Okay. So the funny thing is, I sent my elder daughter and my, both my daughters, they went through all my motivational programs. And, and the joke is that, again, the elder daughter is, when I... I used to tell her when she's young, you know, you know, you're very smart, you can do it. You know what she said? Yeah, I know. <laughs> right? And, and that doesn't motivate her. But when my wife is like, uh, you know, Kelly, you, 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 you know, so lazy. And then, then she's like, okay. You say, all right. Then she start to work. So it's, it's very strange, right? Yeah. So that's why I used to do a lot of parents training last time. Mm. And I say, parents, should you be positive or negative to your children? There's no right or wrong. It depends on their personality. If your child is an away from then you don't tell them the positive things. You tell them that they won't do it because they want to go against you, right? That's one part of it. And of course, the second part of it is that I went for a lot of motivational programs when I was young and it kind of like taught me a lot of these principles uh, that things like there's no failure in life, there's only results, there's only experiences, right? It taught me things like uh, if others can do it, so can you. So it kind of like created all these beliefs in me that no one can make you feel sad accept yourself. No one can make you feel angry except yourself because you create your own emotions. So if someone says to you, you're good for nothing, how you feel depends on how you respond. So if you respond and say, yeah, you're right, I'm good for nothing, then you feel bad, you make yourself feel bad, not that person make you feel bad. But if someone says you're good for nothing and in your mind you go, no, I'll prove you wrong and you get motivated, you created it. Mm. So it's a combination. Mm. Yeah. So the means self-awareness is very important that you must understand yourself first or and maybe as a parent, you need to understand your kid first before knowing the best way of motivating the person, right? So, and at that time you went to attend, I think that was when you're 13 years old, there yeah, was a program this, that helped you to yeah. discover yourself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So I think that's why I think one of the most powerful things that I learned in 
those motivational programs and NLP is that you create your own emotions, right? People always say, oh, he made me angry. Because the stock market crash, I feel sad. No, you create your emotions. So if you feel sad, you are making yourself sad. If you create your emotions, what does it mean? It means you are in control. You have the power to change it like that. So if you feel lazy, you can shift it like that. But you have to learn how, right? To control your thoughts, control your, your, your physiology and stuff like that. So all, all that really helps. Hmm. So if a person who is probably always very negative or they keep on thinking about the problems instead of solutions, what's your advice for them? All right. So first of all, it's because it becomes a habit really. Mm. Like some people, they always talk to themselves this way. Like, why does this always happen to me? Why is life so unfair? How can she say that? How can he do that? Why, why, why me? All right. So it's how you keep talking to yourself. So the way you talk to yourself affects how you feel. Yeah. How you feel affects how you behave. How you behave affects your results, right? So the first thing is, for this person who's always depressed, first be aware, what are you saying to yourself? Mm -hmm. Like some people, the moment they wake up in the morning, they say, what time is it? How much longer can I sleep? Uh, five more minutes, five <laughs> more, right? So if, if you talk to yourself like that, what do you focus on? Mm -hmm. Going back to sleep, because it's your habitual thinking patterns. Right? So once you're aware of it, then shift that pattern. So when you wake up in the morning, ask yourself, you know, what can I achieve today? How can today be even more amazing than yesterday? And at first when you say that it's very conscious, but if you keep doing that again and again, what happens? It becomes a habit. So I'm sure you've read before that if you do something the same way over 20 days or 21 days, it becomes a habit. Yeah. All right. Do you think that these also apply to the stock market? Like, you know, many people are often feeling very emotional by the market movement and all this. How, what's your advice to people who keep on thinking, like, oh my God, you know, the market is crashing and all this. How do you make them more stabilized? Yeah. So I'm sure you've read a lot of investing books, what Buffett said that 70% of investing success is psychology. Yeah. The mechanics of investing, the method is actually very simple. It's very simple, you know. And you can learn how to calculate discounted cash flow. You can learn to read financial statement. You can learn all that. But why is it a lot of people who know all that still can't succeed in the markets? Because they can't control their, Emotion. their emotions, right? So again, it's to train yourself on how you respond. So if the market goes down and you say, and some people like to use certain words like, oh, you know, my portfolio is bleeding. It's all red. <laughs> you know, the market is crashing. And you use words like that. Of yeah. course, you scare yourself, right? But if the market goes down and say, good, yes, now great company selling at a discount, then of course you feel good. Mm. So it's all about your interpretation, how you respond to that event, okay. all right? And one of the powerful things I also learned a lot about is visualization, yeah. all right? Uh, right? So one of the, the tricks I learned is this. So for example, we know that if you look at your portfolio now, it goes up and down. Yeah. Okay. And recently the market was at all time high, but now of course it's going to be a pullback, right? Mm. So for me, every time I look at my portfolio value, I would always imagine that it's down 50%. Oh. Always. Every time I look at it in my mind, I always see it's down 50% and I'm, I feel totally okay with it. Mm. So that when it goes down 10%, it's like, mm, it's okay. So, you know, it's like you already prep yourself, right? The trouble with a lot of people is that if they look at their portfolio now, it's 100,000, right? They feel like the 100,000 is mine already. Uh, it's mine, right? Yeah. So when it drops from 100 to 100K to 90K, they feel angry like, oh, the market took away 10K from me. You know, I lost 10K because you felt the 100K was yours. Uh -huh. But whenever I look at my portfolio, I look at that and I always tell myself that this is not mine. It is just the market's uh, pricing of, of what I have, right? And I, I need to visualize that if it drops 50, 60% the next day, I'm fine with it, right? Because we know that the market price is not the actual value of the business, right? In the short term, the market is not logical all the time. The market is totally irrational and totally emotional, right? And if you know the intrinsic value of your business, like for example, I know for a fact that, for example, uh, Meta, Meta's intrinsic value is about $430, right? Based on my valuation, I know that, right? So even if Meta drops to $100, which it did, yeah. right? To me, it's well, like... $80, I don't know, $85. It yeah, dropped yeah, to, yeah, below yeah, $100, yeah, right? Yeah, below like, $100, right? yeah. And people are like, ah, 
ah, my, yeah. some of my subscribers are oh, freaking alright. Then I was like, no, it's still worth 400. So to me, in my mind, it's worth 400. Yes. All right? But whatever the market price is at, it's none of my business. Mm. It's like the old saying, don't let the market guide you. Let the market serve you. So take advantage of this idiot called Mr. Market. So it's all these tricks that, that I use, right? Visualization and what I say to myself. Wow. Yeah. I think that's very powerful because once you change the language that you talk to yourself, not just in life, but also in your investing area, you will totally have a different mindset and a different stability as an investor as well. Wow, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, JJ, you have any questions? Can I ask when did you actually like pivot? I'm not sure if this concept is anchoring, right? Like the, the yeah. concept of really anchoring down or negative 50%. When then when did you implement this in your whole decade? I can't remember the exact date, but it was over the years. But I'm sure like because you made plenty of mistakes as well, right? Was yeah. it the, that, that still make mistakes? Still, and yeah, we yeah. all make mistakes as traders, right? But yeah. was there an exact point of time that I need to reframe myself to know what I deserve on the market? I think it's after going through so many crashes. Like I mean the mm. first crash I went through was 2000, 2001, the dot-com crash, right? Wow. But I didn't have I didn't have much money in the markets then. Mm. Uh, so that didn't really affect me because I didn't really have money there. But in a way, I was very lucky because I actually started investing heavily in the US market after the crash. Okay. After the wow. O1. Yeah. It, the timing was great. Mm. So when it ran, uh, I did really well, right? Then I went through the 08, 09 crash. Uh, then 2016 was a bit of a crash 2018, the trade war, then of course 2020, the whole thing went down. So after you watch that same movie so many times, <laughs> you, you kind of anticipate you, what like, will happen. Yeah, you know, it's the same movie, right? <laughs> right? You know, the ending will always be happy ending eventually, you know? Uh, so after a while, you realize that if you focus on high quality companies and you know the intrinsic value, any short term price drops is all temporary, right? And, and you look ahead. So the other trick I play on myself, you call it a trick, is that when I look at my portfolio today or a stock I own, I, I see where it is 10 years from now. I see where my portfolio is 10 years from now, the value of it. Yeah. I look at my stock like Nvidia, Microsoft today, I see where it is 10 years from now. So if I see where it is 10 years from now, does it bother me that it drops? It doesn't bother me because I'm looking at that picture in the future. You know, and anything, and anytime it goes lower right now, I say, oh, great, because it's going to get there. So I might as well use it to accumulate more, mm -hmm. right? So it's all about where's your focus? Are you focusing on the short term now or are you focusing on the long run? So it's, yeah. it's very important, right? Uh, talking about, you know, like being a great investor, you always need to think long term, right? Yeah. That's what you say 10 years from now. Yeah. But we also know that business are constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that the businesses that you select are really high quality business that mm. can last with time. So there are many criteria in selecting a business. To me, the most important criteria is the economic mode, mm. which Buffett talks about, right? The sustainable competitive advantage. So for example, a white mode company uh, is defined, it's actually defined by Morningstar, mm. but actually I agree with them, right? So a white mode company is one where you're confident that they will not easily be disrupted by competition for at least 20 years. Wow. That means for the next 20 years, 20 years, no one can touch them. They got little or no competition, like Microsoft, mm. like mm. Your, your alphabet, right? Mm. right? Narrow mode means they can't be disrupted for 10 years, mm. right? No mode means tomorrow they can be disrupted, mm. okay? So when, when I select companies, I only, I primarily invest in companies with very wide modes mm. that I know they got little or no competition. So I'm, I'm quite confident that at least in the next 10, 20 years, they can't be easily disrupted, all right? Of course, there's nothing perfect. Yeah. Like for example, Alibaba, right? <laughs> yeah. So Alibaba, uh, prior to Xi Jinping starting all his tech regulations, it was a white mode company. So it was Tencent, untouchable, right? Yeah. But when that happened, the mode start to deteriorate. Mm. So it can happen. That's why we need to diversify mm. into a portfolio of at least a few great companies. So that if one or two, this kind of thing happened, which you can't foresee, doesn't matter. Collectively, you will still do well. Boeing is another example. I bought Boeing before the, the plane crash. I bought Boeing before the pandemic, you know? Uh, and at the time, Boeing is a white mode company. Yeah. Together with Airbus, you may think no competition. Every year, they make more and more money. It's like Boise, right? Cannot die, right? Then what happened, you know? They got a plane crash, the pandemic, everything bad happened. And uh, for the first time, they lost money in 2020, share price dropped 80%. So imagine if you went all in into that, you die, right? Okay. So I own Boeing. I saw my Boeing drop 80%. 
2020. But despite that, by the end of the year, my portfolio was up 46%. Why? Because I diversified, right? My other stocks made up for it. And at that time, I didn't think Boeing was as bad as today. So actually, I averaged down a lot. Mm. All right, when you draw, I actually averaged down. And then when Boeing bounced back up, I can't remember what price, huh? I got out at a small profit. Okay. Uh, and then now, I'm, I'm, I dare not touch really because I think now it's getting quite bad. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I like to use this analogy. Would you sit on an airplane with one engine? No. Even if it's a Rolls-Royce engine. Right? Even if the best engine in the world, you can still have a bird strike. Yeah. You can still have lightning. You, you don't know, right? Yeah. So same thing. That's why I say don't put all your don't go all into one stock, no matter how much you think that stock is great. Mm. But if you've got a plane with 10 Rolls-Royce engines, mm. it's quite safe. Mm. Right? How can all 10 get hit by bird? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So at the most one or two fail, you still have eight engines. So it's all about diversification. So what's in your opinion the good number for people to diversify on? At least 8 to 10 minimum. Mm. At least 8 to 10. And uh, anything more than that is fine as long as you have the time to monitor. Right? Mm. And, and there's no right or wrong. So for example, you know, we know that Charlie Munger yeah. had only 5 stocks. Yes. Uh, mm. Bill Ackman has about 8. Mm. And I was surprised to know, you know Peter Lynch, who got a 29% annual return yep. for his career, right? Yep. Do you know that on average, he had a thousand stocks in his portfolio on average? Wow. A thousand on, oh on my average. Gosh. Okay. When he took over the Magellan Fund uh -huh. uh, as a fund manager, uh, the fund had uh, 80 stocks. And his boss told him, too many, cut it down to uh, below 50. He didn't listen to the boss. He bought over 1,600 stocks. Wow. And then from there, he ran the fund for 13 years. His average number was 1,000 stocks on average, and he got 29% annual return. So the answer is there's no right or wrong. That's true. No, no one says you must have very little. No one says you must have a lot. It's what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But of course, for Peter Lynch, he, he admitted that at the time, he, I mean, he, had, he spent hours and hours every day just studying those businesses. Mm -hmm. So you don't, if you don't have his time, don't do 1,000, right? Yeah. So for me, I... I only invest in the top 1%, mm. right? So the US market has about five, 6,000. So what's 1% of that? Mm. 50, 60. Mm. So to me, as long as you're below 50 or 60, you're among the top 1%, mm. which is quite good. Mm. Yeah. So going back to just now, you were talking about the US and you also talk about China. And I know that in a recent video you did say that you sold away Tencent and you are also still in the process of uh, selling away other, other Chinese stocks that you, you probably are still holding. Yeah. But what's your take on China? Like, why are you so bearish on it? I think after speaking to a lot of people from China, I, I, I know a lot of people who sit on the boards of Chinese banks. Mm. I know a lot of people who sit on the boards of Chinese listed companies. I know a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in China. And when you talk to them, you get very worried in the long run. It's not just the demographics, which is the falling birth rate and all that, but a lot, I don't know whether I should say this online. I don't want to like disappear and the Chinese government take me away, but so I better not say too much. Let, let me put it this way. Um, if I was an entrepreneur in China, right, would I dare to build my business? I don't know. Because if I get too successful, I can, my business may not be there anymore. You know what I'm saying? So in the kind of environment, mm. is it, will it motivate the capitalist to really grow? I, I don't know. Yeah, I better not say too much. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, also the reason why you slowly trim your way yeah. the stocks. But of course, having said that, I know that the, the stocks are very undervalued. Mm. They are very technically oversold and we should see a bounce eventually, right? Mm. So I'm not surprised that the Chinese stocks today like Alibaba and all that can easily double and triple. They can easily double and triple because they're so cheap, yeah. right? So when they double and triple, I would, I would start to mm. get out. If you look at the last 30 years, uh, China's GDP has been growing like crazy, yeah. but it doesn't translate to market stock market returns. That's true. For some strange reason. Yeah. Mm. And by the way, China is not the only market like that. There's some other markets that are like that. Like that. So I rather invest in a market where uh, the GDP growth translates to market returns. Hmm. And it's definitely a more sustainable and safer way of uh, investing. Yeah. I think in a way it's also incentives. Like for example, we know in the US, they, how do they 
pay their employees. Yeah. Stock-based compensation. So it's very aligned. The employees, the CEO is all aligned to get the stock price up, right? Mm. But Singapore is not like that. Not as much, right? Mm. They pay more salary, not so yeah. much stock-based compensation. Same as China. So the incentive is very different. So if you don't incentivize people with stock, then they rather you know, uh, pay themselves high salary, high bonus, and then screw the shareholders. You die, it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. So the incentive is very different. I also understand that because you, you have really have so many years of experience with money, with wealth creation, but if there's one thing that you wish you learned earlier about money, what would that be? About money or about investing? About money and wealth creation. Learn earlier. Um, nothing much because I... I was lucky in a sense that at a very early, early age, I was exposed to a lot of the right principles of money. And I think one of the most important principles is to be frugal, mm. to, to respect money, to value money, and to spend less than you earn. And I learned that at a very early age uh, because my grandfather on my mother's side was like that. My dad is like that. So I had a lot of good role models in that way. And at a young age, I also read a lot of books like um, The Millionaire Next Door and... All these taught you that people who are truly wealthy, they don't show off. Mm. The ones that show off are normally pretend to be wealthy, not wealthy. But those people who are very wealthy, they don't show off. They, they are very humble. So that's something I learned at a, at a very young age. So I, I don't think I could have learned it earlier. <laughs> yeah. I think you already got started really early yeah. as compared yeah. to other because your dad really gave you a lot of... Uh, great influence on it yeah it kind of yeah. remind me about my grandma as well like she is so frugal that that frugality actually passed down to me which i think is a very very good trait to have yeah. yeah yeah so people laugh at me when i like i just went to a restaurant with my wife we had a nice cafe and i wouldn't order the coffee right it's like six dollars i said i'm not gonna pay six dollars then my wife like, Why are you so <laughs> i say no it's i, I just can't <laughs> you know i know i can get the one dollar sixty cents down the road yeah. and all that you know <laughs> <laughs> so since young, I was drumming to me like that. Mm -hmm. It's about value for money. Mm -hmm. yeah. On what area do you think it's value for money for you to spend on? Okay, that's a good, great question. So I'm the kind of person, I, I'm willing to spend on experiences. I'm willing to spend on convenience. So for example, if, uh, now if I'm taking a business trip, I will take business class, right? Not because of uh, the food, you know, I, I don't drink. I don't need fancy food, but it's the convenience. Mm -hmm. I like to get off the plane fast. I like to go through the um, priority lane. So it's, I'm willing to pay for convenience, you know. Uh, when it comes to experiences like holidays uh, with my family, that I'm willing to spend. But for me, I'm not willing to spend on things so much. I, I'm not a things person, you know. So like, I don't buy latest gadgets. For me, I will only change my iPhone if it breaks down mm -hmm. or it can't work anymore. Or if I get a free one from Singtel. <laughs> if not, I, I, I won't buy a new one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? wow. Shoes. I, I won't buy a new shoe until the shoe, the sole comes out. Then maybe I'll buy one. If not, I'll try and glue, for, glue it back first. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. I think this, this for gravity, like this really treating money as something that is really important helps you to become a better investor as well because you don't want to anyhow just buy because it just looks good, right? But you really want to make sure it's really good, then you buy. Yeah, and, and the question is, does, does it make you happier? You yeah. Know, like, for example, for years and years and years, I, I just wear G2000 jackets. Yeah. Now I don't even wear a jacket, right? So, like, why don't I buy, like, a Churuti or Boss or, you know, yeah. does it make me happier? Mm. No. Does it, you, you know, it, to me, it's, it's just a jacket, right? Mm. You know, I, my, my dad always wanted to give me his Rolex watch. For what? <laughs> you know, I'm happy with my, my Apple watch. <laughs> Does it make me happier? No. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And recently, as I was talking to many great investors and authors as well, I realized that successful people at the end of the day re really focus a lot on relationship. So uh, yeah. how important is relationship to you? Very, very important. I, I think the thing that makes us happiest in life are relationships. So I know people who have got all the money in the world, they've got all the status and, and all that, but they're depressed because they don't have a good relationship with their children or their spouse or, or business partners and all that. And it's very, very sad. Mm. And I also know people who may not have all the money in the world, but they have got great relationships with their family and they are happy every day. So I think the number one thing in happiness is relationships. Mm. And yeah. how do you cultivate good relationships? 
I think it's about number one. Okay, like for example, me and my partner Patrick, you know, we've been together since university days. We have never had an argument mm. in, in, in 20 years of, of business. We have disagreements, we have different opinions, but we've never had an argument. We've never like shouted at each other or that. And it's because we are both have what we call in Chinese very chin tai attitude. Mm. Chin tai is like very easy going, very give and take. We don't count 10 cent, 5 cent, right? And in my life, I always do my best to um, work with people who are like that. I like to work with people who are very easygoing, very... Uh, generous know, in their own Very way. generous, right? Yes. And the moment I meet someone who is like calculative and all that, I, I avoid them like the plague. I don't care what great customer they may be, what great business... No thanks. I avoid. Mm. You know, I, I still remember there was one time, I, I, don't, I don't mention his name, right? So there was this guy, he's quite a well-known entrepreneur in Singapore, very well, well to do, and he wanted to do business with me. So I said, uh, you know, so I said, let's meet up. So he invited me for golf. And then we played golf, right? And I tell you, in playing golf, you can tell how easy going a person is or how meow the person is, right? So one example was, so we're having this flat friendly competition. And, and I, you know, you get a ball in a hole, right? And normally, if your ball lands near the hole, it's like, you don't have to pipe into the hole, it's like, given, oh. right? And, and my ball was uh, next to the hole, and I was like, okay, I was going to take it as, is, you know? Yeah, I, is in, it? yeah. He said, no. <laughs> right? He went there with his putter to measure. <laughs> Sorry? No. It's not close enough, you have to putt. Oh. So I know this kind of person, I cannot do business. Oh. This is the type will count 5 cent, 10 cent with you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I guess, you know, and sometimes by just having a coffee with someone or playing tennis, you can tell that person's personality. So hmm. I, I, in my life, I avoid toxic people, I avoid calculative people, and my hmm. life has been so much happier. Hmm. So firstly, you are a giver, you are generous, yeah. right? For example, you are generous to us, you know, that's yeah. why you come all the way yeah. down here to yeah. meet us. And um, generosity, being kind to other people. At the same time, you also value that. And that's why you select people who are like able to reciprocate. Yeah, yeah. Then it was going to be a very happy and mutual relationship. Is, yeah. that, is that correct? Yeah. I always believe a principle in life is if you can help, help. Mm. If it doesn't cost you your blood, just help. I mean, what's wrong with helping, right? And I think it's about mutual respect also. Mm. You know, that uh, no matter how, how much money you have or who you are, uh, we are all the same soul or whatever. I mean, it's a very Buddhist thing, but we are all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. So I believe the same thing in like animals. I, I will, you know, sometimes, you know, whether it's a cat or dog, I believe that we should not treat them any, any less mm. than us. Mm. I'm going to circle back to a little bit towards investing again. So if, because we also know that individual stock picking is definitely not easy. So what's your advice to investors who are actually very new and they want to start investing the right way? Okay, so I always ask people this question. Are you passionate about analyzing businesses and you want to spend time doing it. And if you're not passionate about it, you don't want to spend time doing it, there's nothing wrong, mm. right? Then you should just buy an ETF mm. and call it a day. That's it. Very simple. Yeah? But if you think you'll be interested to analyze businesses, you think it's fun, then it's actually not that difficult. You can learn it. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of common sense if you think about it. It's actually a lot of common sense. Like, for example, one of the first criteria I look at is, does the business have a history of consistent growth in revenue, profits, and cash flow for at least five years. It, it's, it's quite common sense, right? So if a business can grow their revenue, profits, and cash flow in the last five years, despite the pandemic, despite the recession, then it tells you the business is resilient. Yep. The business is consistent. And just focus on those kind of companies. But people like, we say, oh, I want to buy this stock. I say, but does it make money? Uh, no, but maybe one day it can make money. You know, all right? So it's, 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 it's a lot of common sense, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, not, it's actually not difficult. I see. Oh. The difficult part is the psychology part. That's true. The, the method is actually very simple. Mm. It's like exercising. Mm. Losing weight, is it simple? Yes, but it's simple. not easy. Yeah. Right? It's simple, but it's not easy, right? So it's simple as in, it's not rocket science. If you want to lose weight, do 50 push-ups a day, run 
three cam a day is simple. It's not complicated, but it's not easy, right? Because the, the psychology, can you get yourself to feel like doing it? Yeah. So when you dive deep into all those businesses, you really have the passion for them, right? And that's why you just felt like it's never, it's not work. It's like, yeah, yeah. oh, wow, I get so much joy correct, reading correct. them. It's like curious, like a yeah. treasure hunt, yeah. you know? But if you feel, if you feel like, oh, it's so, so tedious, I don't <laughs> like all these numbers, there's nothing wrong, then just buy ETFs. Hmm. So boils down to self-awareness once again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And another company that um, like recently I was looking into, yeah which is McDonald's. And I do understand that it's a very, very strong business, very strong cash flow and everything, mm -hmm. but it has negative equity. Yeah. And I realized it basically is borrowed a lot of debt to buy its stocks. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, Warren Buffett also said that it only kind of makes sense when it's undervalued, then you go and buy back the stocks, yeah. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. what's your take on this approach? Do you think that it's still safe because the cash flow is consistent? Yeah, so if you look at, interesting, a lot of the restaurant businesses like Yum Brands, McDonald's and Domino's Starbucks, Pizza, they're yeah. all like that. Yeah. They all have the same pattern, yeah. right? Where they, they borrow money to buy back a lot of shares. And actually, Buffett was asked this question before in one of the AGMs, and he said it's fine. He said it doesn't matter if they have ne negative shareholders' equity because it's just an accounting number as long as they are very profitable. So to me, it's fine as long as, number one, they buy back shares when the shares were undervalued. If they buy back shares when the shares are overpriced, then of course it's not a good thing. Then second thing is that they must be uh, consistently profitable. They must have increasing free cash flow. Mm -hmm. Then it's fine. Then the third thing you look at is you compare their free cash flow and their profit to their debt level. So if their debt to EBITDA ratio is reasonable, it's within like three or less, their debt surfacing ratio, that means you take the interest expense divided by cash flow from operations is less than 30%, and it's okay. So all these are nitty gritty numbers that you look at. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, okay. I, I'm, maybe some of our audience are a little bit confused right now. So you can go and Google it and maybe we can put down in the, in the formula over here so that they understand what exactly is Adam saying just now. Um, my next question is, um, right now, actually, you already have like close to a $20 million portfolio. So you technically don't need to work or even have to conduct any courses at all, right? So what keeps you going? No, I love teaching. Hmm. I'm addicted. I, I love teaching. And I still remember what happened was, I, if you read my old books, you know that I, I didn't used to be a very good student. And then what happened was when I went for this super team program when I was young, I learned all these study skills, motivational skills. And then I started studying very hard. And in those days, I learned this thing called mind mapping, which now is very common. But in the 80s, no one has heard of it before. So I was one of the first people to learn mind mapping and I used all these memory techniques. And then I was in a school called Pingyi Secondary School, which is a neighborhood school. But I think now it's merged, so it's not there anymore. And I started to taught my class, right? From the, one of the lousy students, I scored straight A's and all that. And my friends were like, what happened to Adam? Mm -hmm. You know? And it was quite amazing. One day, my geography teacher, she had a two period lesson, 45 minutes times two, right? And she came to me, she said, Adam, are you willing to take one of my periods? And I was like, huh? I was like 15 years old, I was like sec three, right? I was like, huh? And are you, are you my period, you go up there and tell your friends how you improve your results. Wow. You know? So I went up there and then I started to give a seminar on how to do mind mapping <laughs> and memory techniques and setting your goals and how to motivate yourself. And then my friends were like, <laughs> and the girls were like, wow. yeah, yeah. So, so at that moment, I felt like God. Hmm. It's like, wow, I'm important, right? <laughs> so that's when I realized I, I, love, I love to teach because it makes me feel important. It makes me feel smart. And yeah. <laughs> so that's why, right? That's one thing. I mean, number two is that if I don't teach, what, what am I going to do? Mm. Go shopping. I hate mm. shopping. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really hate shopping, right? <laughs> sit on the beach. Now so hot. How to sit on the beach, right? Yeah, so we all need something to do. Yeah. Right? It, it's and, like, and I love this, you know? Yeah. Mm. You it's, get to meet people, hmm. you get to feel smart. Right. And you get, get to really teach the good thing to the students and students see results, right? Yeah. So I always joke that, you know, at home, no one listens to me. <laughs> My wife don't listen to me. The dog and cat don't listen to me. Also. So, but when I teach, people listen to me, right? You know, so. <laughs> I'm just joking about the dog and cat. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That, but that is, I think, 
uh, basically it's a purpose because yeah. you are basically so financially well off that you just want to make sure it's a fulfilling life and yeah, you are doing yeah. what makes you happy as well yeah yeah i remember i mean years ago i learned this uh from one of the tony robbins courses that we all have six human needs mm. all right i don't know if you heard this before right mm. so we all have the need for security mm. which uh, okay if you have enough money you feel security right but we also have the need for variety mm. we all have the need for stimulation so in other words if you got all the money in the world but you have no challenge in life yeah. you get very depressed yeah. that's why there are people who have a lot of money celebrities who get very depressed mm. they take drugs because yeah. they are bored right mm. so we all it's a sound like challenge right then the third need is that we all have a need for significance we all need to feel important so some people they fulfill the need by driving the flashiest cars, living in the biggest mansions, and and all that. Uh, but for me, I feel important when I'm I'm speaking and people are Listen. benefiting from it, mm. right? So we all have our way to meet our need. We also have a need for contribution and growth, mm. right? Wow, and the needs do evolve over time. Correct. The yeah. needs do evolve over time. Yeah. I see, yeah. and. Then for yourself, right, since you got so much money to eventually pass on to your children, how do you make sure that you allocate your asset wisely so that you don't spoil them? That's what exactly what yeah, your dad bet. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest fear is you spoil kids. I'm very proud of my two daughters. Uh, I think we raised them pretty well through our role model. Like my wife herself, she, has, she doesn't wear any jewellery. She doesn't wear any like branded things besides a Lululemon, which she just does for exercise, right? And neither do I. So my kids have grown up with that same value for money. And since they were 15, during their school holidays, they all get their own part-time jobs. And we never told them to find their own job. We never encouraged them. They found their own job. Mm. Yeah. So they work in, um, what's the Mex Mexican Mex restaurant? G -G, Guzman. The Guzman. The Guzman, yeah. They work there. Um, they, they, they work in cafes, they work as a sales promoter. They've done all kinds of jobs, mm. right? And it's because my wife and I never give them any money also. We did the same thing, mm. right? So we don't, we actually didn't give them an allowance. Okay. We just give them food uh, at home and all that. So anything else they want, they, they realize they have to buy it themselves. Mm. So that is what motivated them to find their own job. And what's great is that when they started working, they are, I remember their first salary uh, and I went out with them. Normally I would start paying. And when I brought them out for, for dinner, they, they said that we'll pay. Wow. I was like really touched. I, you know? And when they got their paycheck, they'll come up to me and say, uh, can you put half of it in my brokerage account? Wow. And I, I didn't tell them to do it. I, I didn't influence them. So I was very proud. And I, I knew that, okay, if I die today, my money go to them, I know they won't do something stupid. Mm. You know, hopefully they don't marry the wrong person and change her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for now, but seems safe. Seems safe. It's also because you and your wife have been a role model, right? And yeah. they observe how yeah. you guys live, right? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And that's very, very, very impactful. Like, what are some of the tips do you think that you can give to parents to help their children to really become better? I would say walk the talk. So again, as a parent, if you tell your kids, save money, but you yourself go and buy a brand new car, mm. right? You yourself go and buy the, the, the latest expensive bags, then they're not going to listen to you they're going to observe what you're doing mm. okay live by principles live by principles nice. right and don't waste like like uh we never waste food uh when we go to a restaurant every time extra we will bring back and we'll eat the next day we we never waste food yeah wow it's really frugality like throughout like like you you basically how you do one thing is how you do everything yeah, yeah. that's beautiful I, yeah that's a quote that i love yeah. yeah the way you do anything is the way you do everything mm. yeah correct Ne my next question is like um, if you had lived as long as you wanted you know like, like you have completed every single thing that you want to achieve in your life and right now you have all the great resources like videos on YouTube you're close to a million subscribers you have so many great videos there and you also have your book and a lot of educational resources but on the day of your departure you cannot take them with you and in fact, they will also disappear from the world. Then what will be that free advice that you want to leave before you pass on? To my children or to the world? To the world. Or, or to the world. Or to the listeners. Or to the listeners. Mm. I would say the first one is 
time is short. I think we all know that, but we tend to take it for granted, right? Time is very short. Blink of an eye, you're 50. Blink of an eye, you're 70 or 80, and that's it, right? So time is short. So every day, uh, cherish the people around you. Don't say one day I'll say I love you to the person. One day I'll do it. Just do it now. You know, the next day the person may not be there anymore. And uh, don't sweat the small stuff. You know, a lot of people get very irritated and angry over small things or politics. I mean, for what? You know, why get angry with your wife, your husband and argue? Why? We're going to die very soon, right? So basically cherish every moment and, and whatever you want to do, start doing it now. You know, uh, that's the first thing. I think the second thing is um, yeah, choose to be happy. So like I said earlier on, a lot of people feel that they are not in control of their emotions, that their emotions control them. But the reality is that we control our emotions. If you're happy now, it's because you choose to be happy. Because you're focusing on things in your life that you're grateful for. You're focusing on the things that you have that so many people don't have. But I also know people who have all the money in the world, but depressed. Right? Because they keep focusing on everything that doesn't meet their expectations. I mean, think about it. No matter where you are in life, there's always something that's not meeting your expectation. No matter where you are in life, you can always find someone who has got something more than you and you, you can feel depressed, right? So, yeah, choose to, choose to feel grateful and choose to focus on what you have and you'll be happy. You know, I was just uh, speaking to my domestic helper two days ago. She's from Myanmar. And she just shared with us that, you know, Myanmar, they're having this war, right? Yeah. That she just shared that her family uh, just got driven out of their house from the military. And they are now running somewhere in the jungle and she can't contact them anymore, oh. right? And despite that, she still does her work with a smile. With, with And I was like, looking at her, I was like, my God, if I'm her, I don't know if I can even do that, right? Yeah. And you realize how lucky you are. And here you are complaining, you can't get a parking space. You are complaining <laughs> that whatever, and this poor fella, the family is gone, she can't find a family, God. Hmm. So when you start to focus on what you have, uh, yeah, you, you, why should you feel sad, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Wow, so cherish your time, cherish people that you love, hmm. and choose to be happy. Yeah. What's the last advice? Have no fear of failure, I think. I think a lot of people are so afraid of failure, hmm. right? So I always say it's, it's how you define failure. A lot of people, they define failure as if I don't get my goal, I fail. That's a common way to define failure. But if you define failure that way, then you never dare to set goals. Because I can tell you that very often, whatever goals you set, you will not achieve it the first time. You'll take many, many times, right? So instead, the way I define it is that if I set a goal, I don't achieve it, it's not failure. It's a learning experience. I learn something from it. And the only way I can fail is if I don't even give it a shot. Mm. That means it, the greatest failure in life is the failure to participate. If you don't even participate, that's failure. But if you participate, you can't fail. You either succeed or you learn something from it. Mm. Yeah, I think if I can sum up the essence of uh, what has helped me over the years is, is these three principles. Mm. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the latest video that you published about success. Yeah. Right, that a lot of people would think that only they achieve a goal, then they become successful. But mm. then you said that actually success is every day. It's a journey, right? Yeah. You just have to be improving every single day to get closer. To feel to, successful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's very wise. So make sure to go and watch it if you have not. <laughs> and last but not least, what do you think is like, how do you cultivate that gratitude, that love? Do you have that in your daily routine? Like what's your routine like? I guess it was through a lot of my training I went through. Again, when I was young, I went through a lot of this personal development training where they taught us about gratitude, the power of gratitude. So I, I learned it there and I learned it through a lot of books as well. And so since then, it's become a habit to me that I always focus on gratitude or what I have. You know, you know start to read books that enrich you, find role models that, that, that do that. Mm. It's never too late. It's never too late. It's always... Yeah easy to start and we just have to keep going towards that. Yeah. And lastly, um, I think our listeners are also very curious about like exactly where can they follow you more? Um, when do they think that they can learn more from you? Uh, go to my YouTube channel, subscribe. I'm on Facebook. Make sure I'm the guy with the blue tick. There's a lot of fake people around. I'm on Twitter as well. I'm on um, 
uh, LinkedIn as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, my website uh, where I've got my courses and subscriptions is piranaprofits.com. Yeah. Definitely go and check it out because there are so many valuable resources that Adam literally just give away for free. Like every, I think he is, in fact, the most consistent content creator. Uh, I, actually, no. <laughs> I think so. Like compared to, I mean, like I talk about locally like Singapore. Yeah. I really felt that you give out the most amount of value and so consistent and every single of your content, it's really well thought through. And you, and that's why so many people love it and people oh, yeah. all over the world follow you. Great. Right? Yeah, appreciate so it. thank you so much once again for being here on our channel and uh, being so gracious with your time, being so nice to us to come down all the way. All right. So thanks everybody for watching. So in this episode, uh, Adam went through a lot in terms of investing about relationship, about life as well. Uh, in the next video, which is in JJ's channel, he actually went through a lot about business insights, like exactly how can you find a great business partner? What are the things to that you should look out for in order to build a successful business like like he does right so if you want to make sure you find out different aspects about business as well then make sure check out the video over here to find out more about business insights from adam cool so we will see you guys there thank you